Hello, everyone. Uh, we would like to welcome you to NYU School of Law and for the Mothers-in-Law panel. Um, but I would like quickly like to thank everyone who made today, tonight possible from our wonderful panelists to the Birnbaum Women's Leadership Network who has been our partner in this and of course our law women and our partnership and diversity committee. Um, before we all start, I would like to just quickly introduce ourselves. Let's see. Thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Lexi Julian. I'm a second year at NYU and I'm one of the co-chairs of Law Women's Partnership and Diversity Committee. Hi, I'm Anna Molina. I'm also a tool, and I am also a uh, co-chair of the Partnership and Diversity Committee. But again, thank you all so much for coming. And I want to quickly explain about the genesis of this event. In the fall of 2021, I started law school with a four-month-old baby and in the middle of a pandemic. So it was kind of a lot. And I immediately knew that I had to seek the wisdom of others and who had done this before me. And I spoke to so many women attorneys in the various stages of life and caregiving, some of whom actually are joining me tonight on the panel, and some of whom are in the room. I wouldn't have made it through 1L or 2L without them. And throughout these conversations, there was this common thread of resilience and practicality. These are key strengths for any caregiver, but they're also key strengths for any successful lawyer. So that's something that we wanted to know, uh, to explore further. This, this panel was born out of a desire to sh share our collective wisdoms and begin to, uh, conversations how to, sh how to improve the legal profession. We just want to note that tonight is just the start of what we hope is going to be a long and ongoing conversation about caregiving while in the law. In preparing for this event, we talked to U.S. senators, we talked to legal academics, we talked to law students, we talked to the spouses of law students, and this is something that matters to everyone. Issues of gender equity in the workplace, issues of supporting our caregivers and being able to have fruitful lives as legal professionals, it's something a lot of folks are invested in, some of whom you're going to hear from tonight on the panel, and others who you will get to meet in the reception afterwards. So we're really looking forward to getting the conversation started, but just know tonight it's not the end, it's only the beginning. And with that, I think we'd like to introduce our fantastic panelists. Um, so beginning with Andrea Basham. Andrea Basham is a partner in Freshfield's corporate and M&A group. Andrea ad advises domestic and international corporate and financial sponsor clients on M&A and majority and minority investments in public and private companies. She also advises on corporate governance and securities law matters. Andrea has also been instrumental in reshaping Freshfield's US practice through recruitment and mentoring. She has com been committed to recruiting associates that allow Freshfield's to consistently present a diverse team and has been instrumental in recruiting a summer class that is majority women, ethnically racially diverse, or LGBTQ+. Andrea took six years off in the middle of her career to be a stay-at-home mom with her two boys when they were young, and being a mom is the most important of the many jobs she has in her life. Andrea received her JD from NYU School of Law and earned her BA from Vanderbilt University. We also have with us tonight Cassie Deskis. Cassie graduated from NYU Law in 2018. After graduation, she worked for two years in the New York governor's office, and then she clerked for District Judge Nelson S. Roman of the Southern District of New York and Circuit Judge John O. Newman of the Second Circuit. She is currently a litigation associate at Patterson Belknap, a New York City-based firm. Cassie has a five-year-old daughter who she gave birth to in her 3L year and a one-year-old daughter who she gave birth to at the end of her district court clerkship. So Jennifer Weiss Wolf is an attorney, advocate, and author, and she is also the du executive director of the NYU Birnbaum's Women Leadership Network. Prior to this, she was vice president and, and the inaugural Woman in Democracy Fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice. She also leads partnership and diver in strategy at MISS, the feminist movement making magazine. A passionate writer and on and advocate for issues of gender and politics. She was dubbed the architect of the US campaign to squash the tampon tax by Newsweek. Her 2017 book, Periods Gone Public, Taking a Stand for Menestral Equity, was lauded by Gloria Steinem as the beginning of liberation for us all. 
Her forthcoming book, period, full stop, The Politics of Menopause, will be published by NYU Press in 2025. Jen's scholarship has been published by the NYU Review of Law and Social Change, Columbia Journal of Gender and Law, and William and Mary Journal of Race, Gender, and Social Justice. Her writing and work have also been featured in the New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, Time, Cosmopolitan, Harper's Bazaar, Teen Vogue, and PRS, PBS, and now this, among others. Jen is also a proud of mom of three now young adult kids and spent eight years of her career with them by her side at home as she led their school PTA and at the community business she conceived and launched when they were toddlers, a consignment store called Milk Money. We also have council member Sandra Ung. Sandra Ung represents the 20th council district, which includes Flushing, Mitchell Linden, Murray Hill, Queensboro Hill, and Fresh Meadows. After escaping the Cam Cambodian genocide as a child, Sandra and her family immigrated to New York City when she was just seven years old. Sandra attended local New York City public schools, including PS22, JHS 189, Flushing High School, and Hunter College, and got her JD from Columbia Law School in 2001. She continues to live next door to her parents and is their primary caretaker. Before joining the New York City Council, Sandra worked as an attorney in a nonprofit defending survivors of domestic violence and advocating for their families. She later served in government on the municipal, state, and federal level, including most recently in the office of Congresswoman Grace Meng, where she assisted constituents with immigration, veteran affairs, and social security cases. A lifelong com community advocate, Sandra has served as an executive director of At the Table PAC, a political action committee dedicated to expanding women and minority representation in politics. She, al she also serves on the board of managers of the Flushing YMCA. Throughout her career, Sandra has advocated on issues that impact women, survivors of domestic violence, our youth, and the environment. When COVID-19 ravaged her community, Sandra organized mutual aid efforts to bring hot meals to families in need. As a state committee woman, she organized a mammogram truck to come to Flushing and connect underserved communities with vital health care services. And then in the city council, she continues to fight to bring more services and funding to District 20 and its residents. So please join me in welcoming our amazing panelists. love to start with you and kind of reflecting back on your time as a clerk. So you were a parent during law school and after graduating you went on to do two clerkships. Many people self-select out of clerking because of the added challenges of being a parent or being a caregiver during a really demanding job. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experience clerking while you had one child and then another on the way? And how was your experience different from those of other clerks? Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, when I started clerking, I was kind of terrified um, based off what I've heard from other people. Um, I think clerkships being that they're often a one-year gig, they're very prestigious. Um, there's like a sense of you know, not being able to take vacation because it is just like one year and I think a lot of people think you should like kind of grin and bear it and do whatever you have to do. Um, so I was, I was kind of freaking out, um, but I, that really wasn't my experience at all. I had a really great judge and terrific co-clerks and honestly, I don't think the judge made it be anything different than any other job that I've had. Like it was, I had my work, I had to get my work done. Um, but he was very understanding of my commitments. Um, I ended up getting pregnant a couple of months into my clerkship. He was very understanding of that as well. My co-clerks and I had a great relationship. We often covered for each other. Um, and I think being that it ended up being during the pandemic, that also was had a nice benefit you know, because uh, I, we were able to work in a hybrid environment. So that was nice as well. Um, but I think, I mean, I would be lying if, if I said I didn't go into it kind of terrified that I was like not going to be able to like meet my commitments at home. Um, and I do think that this is a very judge-dependent thing. I have friends that have clerked 
um, and gotten pregnant in clerkships with other judges and had not had it go over very well. So I think, you know, it really depends on who you clerk for, but both of my judges were great judges to work for. Um, I think the other thing that was kind of stressful for me was getting pregnant <laughs> while I was clerking. Um, clerkships don't really have a good like HR support system like other judge jobs do. Um, and as a clerk in New York, uh, I wasn't actually entitled to any kind of like maternity leave protection even though I was 11 months into my clerkship when I gave birth. The New York State Paid Family Leave actually exempts public employers um, and they get to choose whether or not to opt into it. Uh, so I kind of had to just figure out what I was going to do with my judge. And I do know some clerks that have had their judges provide like off the books leave to them, <laughs> um, which is great. In my case, because I was due four weeks before the end of my clerkship, I decided I just want to leave. I have another clerkship line up a couple months later. I just wanted to be done. But I definitely had some anxiety around my due date. <laughs> um, and I was a little nervous that like, what if I gave birth three months early or something? And I would end up leaving my co-clerks in a bad situation where they were both like handling my docket. Um, luckily, that did not happen, and it was all great. Um, but I guess all that is to say, in some, I had a great experience. I think a lot of my uh, kind of stresses were kind of self-brought um, or due to a lack of representation. I think if there were more people that were parents or pregnant, then it would have been a different experience. Um, and kind of dovetailing off that, my circuit clerkship uh, was with a judge who uh, has been offering a remote clerkship for I think well over a decade now um, and attracts a lot of parent applicants. <laughs> so I went into that clerkship um, having spoken to several of his former clerks that were parents when they clerked for him. And that really did make a big difference because I came in kind of without that like chip on my shoulder thinking like, oh, are people going to like think I'm a slacker because I'm a mom? Or you know, are they gonna think like, ooh, why did you get pregnant? Um, and again, I think a lot of that was self-internalized, but it, it was definitely a different experience, and I think that really speaks a lot to the need for more diversity in clerkships. Yeah, thank you for all of that. I think that's given us all a lot to think about behind the curtain of judicial chambers. Andrea, turning to you, um, corporate transactional practice mm -hmm. is notoriously a super simple, super easy, totally not hectic area <laughs> of the law. Um, and you've spent your career working in it. You've worked on several billion dollar cases throughout your career. You've done an incredible amount, clearly, your partner now. So can you tell us a little bit about how you managed to be a successful corporate lawyer and a mother during those times? Yeah. Um, interestingly, I'll start by saying that it scares me that we still live in a world where the first adjective that came to Cassie's mind was that it's terrifying <laughs> to go through this process. And that's how I felt when I first had a child in big law. And to be clear, and, and um, Lexi mentioned it at the beginning, so I opted out when I had my first child. I am now at Fresh Fields. I moved over to Fresh Fields about four years ago for various reasons, including that I thought it offered a more gender-friendly and parent-friendly environment for me. Um, and I can talk about that as well. But um, I was always in big law. I was always at a big Wall Street firm. And when I had my first child, I thought I was going to come back in three months and gun it for a partner and do whatever was necessary. And I had been working crazy hours. My child was born five weeks early. That was very scary. My water broke um, on the 48th floor of One Liberty Plaza. So these things happen, and you have to grapple with them, right? And so. I went on maternity leave and I was never planning to stay out for as long as I did, but I loved being a mom. I loved everything about it. And to be really honest, after having worked the hours that I had worked, I was a fourth year associate at the time, I thought having a newborn was the easiest thing ever. <laughs> it was fantastic. I got to take naps during the day. This little thing <laughs> smiled at me, nobody yelled at me. Um, so it was kind of lovely. And the firm kept calling and saying, you know, every three months or so they would say, are you coming back? And I kept saying, I need three more months. I need three more months. And they called finally kind of two years-ish into this and said, you know, we have a really big summer associate class starting and we kind of need your office. What's your plan? And I was like, well, I'm pregnant again. So <laughs> let's talk in a couple of years. And to their credit, after about five and a half years had passed, I decided I really wanted to go back to work. And I always kind of knew I wanted to go back to work. 
I looked at various opportunities, mostly outside of big law, but I liked being a law firm lawyer and it kept kind of pulling me back. And all my friends who I had gone through this building with were like, you are batshit crazy to go back to big law. How can you even think about this? But the firm was really welcoming. And so I, I went back and I am a corporate lawyer and transactional practice is definitely unpredictable and has a lot of ebbs and flows, but I learned to manage it and I now have you know, spent a lot of time thinking about how I was able to manage it and often find myself talking to young women who are in the same position I was in and I try to give them advice that is concrete and helpful. And I think this advice is not just applicable to being a parent in big law or, or any type of law, but hopefully advice that is applicable across the board to making a life work that's going to be difficult. You know, we all chose a profession that's going to be challenging and demanding. And so I think that regardless of where you end up, it, as a person and as a parent, you in this profession have to be very purposeful about thinking about what you want. Of course, our careers evolve. And as a parent, of course, how you're going to be as a parent is going to be evolutionary. But you do have to go into it with concrete thoughts about, this is how I want my personal life to work. These are the things that are most important to me. These are the things that I want to give up. And with respect to kids, we all have a different approach. It's you know, what's going to be most important for me? Is it the big moments and the final, you know, soccer championship? Or is it being home for bedtime every single night? Is it being available in the morning because I have someone who can be available in the evenings? These are going to be different answers for every single person. But I think that if you are going to be a parent, in particular in big law, you do have to give more thought to what your answers to those questions are to make it work because no one's going to hand the answers to you without you thinking about it. And then once you've sort of formulated what your own hopes, dreams, aspirations, and goals are in being a parent, I do think that you also have to be really purposeful about creating a structure and a support network around you that is going to help you navigate your path. Again, regardless of which of our paths you choose. You know, I think that sometimes people go into a profession and have this sort of expectation that their mentors and their sponsors are going to be handed to them on a silver platter and those people are going to be like, here's your career. I'm going to walk you through it. I'm going to get you from point A to point B. And it doesn't really happen that way. And the people who I've seen succeed in the law are really those who have been more proactive about seeking out mentors, seeking out sponsors, finding the people who you want to emulate, talking to those people. You know, I respect Anna so much because she reached out to me. We had this random connection through another partner at my firm and I thought you were doing exactly the right thing, right? Not waiting for someone to tell you how to do it, but taking advice and looking to people to help you through it. So that's kind of the first piece of, of how I managed to find my way. I sought the right people. I really knew what it was that I wanted in terms of the structure of my own life. And I was articulate about that. And it, you know, and I've followed those people throughout my life, which is partly how I ended up at Freshfield. Um, and that is the structure that allowed me to get to where I am today. Um, my second piece of advice, and again, this goes to everyone, not just parents, is be forgiving with yourself. We are not going to be perfect professionals and we are not going to be perfect parents. Um, I raised, so I have two boys, one is 17 and one is 14. I raised them in Brooklyn and um, my best friend always used to say, if you can go to bed at night and on average over time, like think that you've been 80% of the parent you wanted to be that day, then that is a great thing, especially in New York City. Um, and that was her mantra. And you know what? We all are type A. That's probably why we're all sitting in this room. And we have really high expectations of ourselves. And 
I think it means a lot to get to 80% of our highest expectations on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a little different professionally. Your client's not going to accept you coming to them and being like, I did 80% of what you wanted me to do. <laughs> but you can apply the same concept to your job. You know, you don't have to take on every administrative responsibility or volunteer for every dinner. You can structure your life, I think, professionally in a way that works for um, being a parent. And I guess my third piece and my last piece of you know, concrete advice in terms of making it work is you have to expect the unexpected and you have to be patient and you have to give back, right? You have to be flexible. Things are gonna happen, clients are gonna be demanding and sometimes you're gonna have to just take a deep breath and know when to ask for help or when to ask somebody to cover for you and you have to get over any sort of personal embarrassment or you know fear that that's going to hinder your career because sometimes it's just a fact that you're going to need it and I think that if you are someone who also is able to turn around and say you know that person did that for me and I'm going to give back whether it's in the same way or a different way that's going to take you a really long way in life. So, um, Council Member Ung, we'll transition to you. So, um, one thing I did not say about myself in my introduction, but I have, I'm an immigrant and I have worked in um, immigration justice prior to law school. So, to me, um, the intersection of immigration and parenting and caregiving is so important. And it's clearly important to you, too. You have worked with many immigrants throughout your career, from your time as a public interest attorney and a city council member for a heavily immigrant area. And you yourself, as you said, you're an immigrant. So why is reform and support for caregivers integral to immigration justice? Sure, so um, unlike the whole panelists up here today, I am not a mom, and when I say I'm a caretaker, I, um, I have my parents, my senior parents, um, we immigrated to the United States, I uh, said the bio was seven. Um, actually, my dad recently passed away last year after a very long illness uh, with Parkinson's. And, you know, for me, you know, going through that process, going with my mom and my dad made me realize, you know, caretaking of seniors is an important topic that I don't think we often talk about. And I don't think, you know, I'll frame it as, as you know, as a, from an immigrant community that I represent and for myself. Um, language access and language justice is actually one of the issues that it is so important, whether it's caretaking for your parents or caretaking for your children. When you, um, you know, because my parents didn't speak English, English isn't their first language, you know, anything they needed when they were here in the United States, and it could be simple things like, you might not, people might see this, like, you know, um, going to the doctor, finding the right doctor, they want to make sure I was there, to make sure like everything they heard is really accurate. It could even be a doctor who speaks the language, but still, they're a little not as confident and not as confident about advocating for themselves in, at the end of the day, a culture that is different than the one they came from. Um, you know, also from you know, a parent uh, perspective, especially, you know, I talk to many constituents in my role and also in the role when I work for a Congress member, you know, just seeking out access for your child or how to enroll your child into school. I mean, the programs here, like, you know, getting into public school in New York City right now is not so easy. Figure out what's the best, you know, um, school for your child is not so easy. Making sure they get the best education they can, making sure they get the programs that they deserve it's also really not easy to begin off, but when um, English isn't your first language and this isn't the culture you're, you know, that you grew up in and you even know where to reach out to, when you hit a stumbling block, like who do you talk to? I mean, that's why, you know, for me, it, you know, it, when you say immigration justice, um, it's, you know, it really is intertwined mm -hmm. into caretaking. Yes, thank you. I, everything you spoke was felt very frank through. Um, so Jen. You've worked in the executive leader at the Brennan Center for Justice. You're a book author and a policy advocate, and you also have three kids. So I'm sure there's a time when the work felt more urgent than the time you had to give. How does one manage being and having that idealistic drive for bettering the world and balancing that and managing that with caregiving responsibilities? Thank you. Okay, okay so folks can hear me. I don't have to lean in. Okay, good. 
Um, I want to just actually pause and say how extraordinary it's been to listen to all of you around us as the uh, executive director of the Birnbaum Women's Leadership Network. Um, I've been talking to Anna and other students since I arrived here in August about what it means to sort of have these conversations at the law school. And Andrea, you just said, oh, I have to put my glasses on to see what I wrote down, <laughs> making a life work. And that's really been something we've been trying to, to zero in on with these kinds of conversations. Um, and as Lexi said, there are gonna be more of them to come. Um, it's interesting because all of, I, I always feel like I have this kind of universalish experience having been a nonprofit my entire career. So it's, it's kind of also mind blowing to be sitting you know, side by side with folks who've had completely different, um, either, even though our career sort of started out at the same place, we've gone in different tracks. And I think one of the real traps in nonprofit work um, is this notion of idealism, that you're somehow doing the work to make the world better, and therefore that's a different kind of pressure than anybody else might put on you. Um, it's probably no secret that a lot of women and a lot of parents and caregivers wind up in nonprofit with this notion too that perhaps it's a slower pace and easier pace, and maybe it is. I have nothing to compare it to other than coming to the university, and I can share some thoughts about that too. Um, <laughs> but. Um, but, but I was at a pretty heady nonprofit during a time where issues of democracy and justice were front and center in American life and actually did feel um, you know, death-defying at times and, and that the work we were doing at the Brennan Center in particular, but also the advocacy and writing I was doing, like it, like it just mattered so much to me. And I think there's a real fear that, or a real concern that that can get, uh, I don't know, somehow leveraged or taken advantage of in ways that, that then some of the best practices or best themes of leadership kind of fall by the wayside um, because it's like you must, like there's a moral obligation to do it when at the end of the day, it's work and work's work um, and you still can create those boundaries. Um, but that said, there are often times where I just wanted to be Working, I, I keep I keep my photos all saved on my iPad. I have like eight thousand photos there, and there's all these pictures of me. There's so many pictures of me writing. It's kind of weird. A lot of my childhood picture, my kids' childhood picture game uh, pictures are of me writing, are of me writing on the sidelines of a lacrosse game, are of me writing in the car. Um, people thought it was funny to take a picture of me like having fallen asleep with my computer and like the cat on me, but. Um, <laughs> I'm not really sure how I feel about that. I'm sort of admitting it, um, only to tie these remarks together to say that I think we all have to be careful about how we view work and we really are deliberate um, and thoughtful about the boundaries we create, about the reforms that we seek, um, about the workplace we aspire to, um, and how to really understand what it means to define work, to define the work of parenting, to define the work of work, to define the work of mission, um, because those three can actually crash into each other in ways that are unintended um, and, and equally detrimental. So I don't think I answered the question about how I did anything, but I was mindful of it and mindful of where I was dropping the ball and mindful of um, when I was still sometimes hitting it out of the park um, and mindful about who I felt I owed my time and commitments to. And I'll also just wrap it up with, I also took time out of the workforce as you mentioned, I started this, this community business because I don't sit still very well um, and just brought my kids with me. I remember the pediatrician one day telling me that um, he happened to drive by while I was going to open the store and saw me, you know, schlepping the three kids in and, and bags of other people's clothing and stuff. And, and I remember feeling really proud. Like when my kids come home, when we sit down at the dinner table, my kids know how my work day went because they were there. Um, and um, not for everyone, but anyway, all the little pieces of the story. But I don't know how deliberate it all it was, but it, it, it all had the same underpinnings of really wanting to create a mission-driven life um, for better or for worse. So I don't think I answered the question at all, but there are some food for thought there, perhaps. Well, one of the underlying themes I'm hearing from everyone is um, an idea of flexibility and also of forgiveness of self, which is definitely something that I think many of us struggle to do, deal with in our, the rooms here, um, because both on the parent, on the caretaking flexibility and our forgiveness, and as well as our professional lives. But one other thing I've picked up on is the 
idea of responsibility of this there's this longer there's this responsibility to something bigger than yourself be it, be it the your professional or your or the people who you love who you're caretaking for and Sandra I want to go back to you that you've described the plight that caregivers often face you know either you get demoted for go or fired or you can't take your um, loved one to a doctor, to a dentist, to something that's really important. And so as a legislature, what are you doing to ameliorate those conditions and what can other local leaders and maybe even national and state leaders do? Sure, so I, I mean, I'll just talk from the New York City Council level. We actually have um, most women ever in the New York City Council, uh, 51 <laughs> of us, we have a, um, a super majority there. And actually, we have, I believe, the most women mothers, too, with young children. Um, it's, you know, so I'll say the, on the city council level, you know, in the past, and this is probably with a pandemic, you have to go in to vote. That's actually just like a, a rule. And then you have to go into your committees, right? So actually, because of the pandemic, there's been some flexibility in that, especially if you're a mother. Literally, you can vote remotely. And you know you can participate in your um, committee hearings remotely too, and I think that was actually very helpful. I'll just say that as an employer point of view, um, you know that was very helpful um, to you know because sometimes you don't you don't live like city hall is you know downtown, but you know you represent there's 51 of us. Some of us live like in Sand Island, so it takes a, the commute time sometimes really does take a long time. So I think from the city council level, in terms of employer, I think that was a really good, um, you know, that was really great. And also, in personally, as just a employer myself, as a city council member, um, you know, I think flexibility, what you were saying, is very important. Um, it's very important as employer, you know, I have, a, I have a small staff, there's like six of us, but regardless of that, it's important, like, when everyone asks, you know, like, if, if my kid is sick, um, I just have to leave right now. If I have to do something, there is really a very, like, like in my office, and I have someone in my office sitting right here, <laughs> looking at me, I'm hoping you can agree with me. So, that, you know, it's, it's like a very open door, honest policy. You, like, I, you know, I don't think any employer should make it so difficult for someone to want to leave early. You know, you don't have to document that your kid is sick. You don't have to bring in like a, you know, a doctor's note. If you have to go, you have to go. If your kid like has even a PDA meeting, if you have a play, if there's something going on that night, if you just have to go, then you know, you should. And lastly, just on a policy level, I would say New York City Council, we have two, um, you know, legislative policies. Right now, uh, we are trying to make sure the 3K program um, is really going to be expanded. I know the 3K program, especially if, um, you know parents who have very young kids, is very important. Uh, it's important to have a place where you know your children can go. Um, and also, we also have the summer rising program. That was something that came out of the pandemic of actually having um, summer, you know, like you know, academic enrichment in public schools. During the summer, and I know that that did come out of the pandemic, making sure the kids, you know, the students actually do catch up. But I heard from a lot of parents, it actually is very helpful to them to have um, somewhere for the children to be during the summer months. And, you know, because some of the private costs can really be, you know, very high, especially in summer. And lastly, um, there's like a new pilot program for New York City. It's called Promise NYC where, you know, there's a lot of um, undocumented immigrants, and I know we all heard about the, you know, the, you know, asylum seekers, where they actually do not, you know, have any uh, available means to have any resources. So Promise NYC is actually, you know, where New York City actually do um, pay for childcare services for undocumented um, families, which then give, of course, um, you, know, the, you know, the parents uh, ability to go out and um, earn a living. That Congressman, and I think that something we're also hearing tonight too is just thinking about the different ways that we can navigate current workplace environments, whether as leaders ourselves of those workplaces and the policies that we're setting for those who work for us, or in figuring out workspaces that are going to support the kinds of lives we want to lead. And Cassie, I want to go back to you. You mentioned in your first answer that you had had a really positive experience in your courtship and that you had found family-friendly chambers and really understanding judge 
but clerkships aren't forever, right? And you had to decide where to go after. But I'm curious if you could speak to the networks you kind of tapped into to find a clerkship that was going to be supportive like that, and then to how you made the decision to ultimately go where you did after your clerkship. Yeah, so for my first clerkship, um, I didn't really tap into a network. I kind of applied very broadly. Um, I did have some assistance from NYU's clerkship office. Um, they have like a massive list of all NYU former clerks and who they've clerked for. Um, and I use that to kind of inform my search. Once I got interviews, I contacted all of the NYU former clerks from the judges that I interviewed with and asked them what it was like. Um, when I was interviewing for my district court clerkship, I actually was like in my first trimester of pregnancy and I was interviewing for clerkships three years out. Um, I think that they've since changed the clerkship hiring time frame, but there was a time period where it was like insane and people were hiring like three, four, five years out. Um, so I had no idea <laughs> what it was going to be like to be a parent, but I knew I was pregnant and I knew there would be a kid. Um, so uh, I did talk to uh, a lot of the judge's former clerks, um, and that was really helpful because I could figure out like what hours were they working, what, what kind of judge was the judge, uh, you know, um, and that was really informative. My judge is very much a family first kind of person, um, so it was very helpful for me. Um, yeah, so I definitely tapped that. For my second clerkship, it was a lot easier because I had people who had referred to me that like this judge is a family friendly judge, you know, he's great to work for. Um, and, and so I, I had that going for me. I think another resource could be current clerks in chambers because even if they're not clerking for a particular judge that you're applying for, like word gets around. Um, so if you talk to a clerk in a certain, like, uh, in a certain courthouse, like they'll probably know about the different temperaments and work schedules of other judges. Um, and then the other thing I'll say is that um, it's important to bear in mind that someone's politics um, and their policy beliefs are not the same as their like employer beliefs. Uh, so some people who may be like very progressive and think that we should have very progressive uh, workplace policies don't necessarily implement them in their own chambers. And I think like a lot of uh, people that I know who've had negative clerkship experiences like did not realize that, and so they didn't really do their research and they thought this is like a great person or. Um, but maybe they're not. And I, I think that's also true for people who are mothers. Like some people who are mothers um, have different views of motherhood than others. And I think you may find that like some mothers like really are not that accommodating because that's not the way that they had their career. So I just think that's like important to bear in mind. Um, and then coming out of the clerkship, I was like, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, I had worked for two years in the governor's office before, which overlapped for six months with COVID. So it was kind of a, um, a little bit of a crazy time. I kind of had originally the sense, I think that you were talking about with nonprofits, which is like, oh, this is gonna be like better work-life balance, but uh, actually it's not always the case. Um, and I still like public service, but I was sort of like, well, I've never been at a law firm. I didn't even uh, do a summer at a law firm. Maybe I should try this out. Uh, I spoke with my judges, I spoke with a lot of people I knew, um, I told them that I was looking for family friendly, cham like, uh, sorry, chambers, for family, family friendly place to go. At the time, um, you know, COVID really had made it hard to have two young children. <laughs> um, and it, like, it wasn't until like really last summer that they stopped doing quarantines and daycares every time there was an exposure. So like my life for two and a half years was like, oh, this kid's home for seven days because they were, you know, 30 minutes playing soccer with so-and-so, and then this kid's home for seven, it was crazy. So it was really important for me to find a place that uh, was family friendly. So I interviewed at a lot of places. I ended up choosing Patterson um, because it just like really clicked for me. They have a lot of associates and partners with young children. Um, they are very family friendly. Like. We have like children's parties <laughs> and stuff like that. Like I'm like when I go to lunches, like people are always chatting about their kids. Um, when I interviewed at other firms, like I didn't find that to be the case. There are a lot of firms where there's like one or two associates have a kid or something. But at Patterson, it's not like that. Um, I think one reason is that they tend to hire a very large clerkship class every year. Um, they don't have any internship program. Uh, they I think they do hire some uh, students right out of law school, but it's like very targeted. Uh, program so I think a lot of the attorneys tend to like be a little bit older um, and a little bit more mature so I think that just naturally those people are more likely to have kids uh, so yeah that's why I chose it, it ended up being so far a very good fit for me um, yeah thank you 
And Andrea, ping-ponging back to you, um, kind of in a similar vein, we'd love to hear more about the Fresh Fields Returners Program, um, thinking about how it's been implemented and how it supports attorneys, and why do you think it's been such a success in Fresh Fields specifically? Yes, yeah, so the Fresh Fields Returners Program is something that I think is actually really unique to U.S. big law firms. And it was founded about two years ago, really out of a recognition and acknowledgement that there are people like me and so many other iterations of me who have been out of traditional big law for whatever period of time, who are creative thinkers and can really help solve clients' problems even if they haven't been doing exactly what everybody else has been doing for the last however long. And so the program is focused on bringing in lateral associates who have had diverse backgrounds that may not have been big law backgrounds. And it really has resulted in a lot of parents who have taken some time off getting the opportunity to come back into big law. Um, and I'll talk in a minute about why it's been really successful, because, it, but I want to pick up on something Cassie said, which is related. So Cassie made the point that policies are one thing and how people actually implement them is can often be totally different. And one piece of advice I would give all of you with respect not to just parenting, but mentorship programs at employers, training programs, whatever it may be, no employer is ever going to look you in the eye when you say, tell me about your mentorship program and say, we don't have a mentorship program, right? <laughs> They're going to like tell you the party line of what the policy says their mentorship program is. And that's helpful, but as you go through interviews your whole life, I would recommend that instead of asking what the policy is, you say, I assume you have a mentorship pro policy, maternity policy, whatever it may be. Tell me a story about how it has been successful for you or not, or successful for your friend down the hall. Because I think that that really gives you a much more concrete idea of what the institution is that you're applying to than just asking them to tell you what's on paper. Um, in terms of the returners program at Freshfields, it came partly out of what is a really global approach to managing people. And so Freshfields is a very global firm. It's you know historically based in the UK. It has grown tremendously over the years in merging with European, another European institution, and it has grown in Asia, it's grown in Europe, and now in the last three years it's grown, you know, doubled in size in the US. And the benefit of being so global is that you can pull from the best parts of each geography. And I didn't really come to realize this as, until I got to Freshfields, but I, so I knew coming in that there were a ton of women partners in leadership positions at the firm in a way that I had not seen at typical New York firms. And when I got here, I realized that part of that stems from the fact that when you think about Europe and Europe's approach to gender and to parental leave, in Europe, mothers take a year off, right? And they're expected to come right back to work. It's very different from the US in that sense, particularly when I had my children and maternity leaves were three months at best. And so part of the returners program was this recognition that we have all of these women leaders at the firm in other jurisdictions because they, you know, live, eat, and breathe in a place where it's totally accepted to be out for a long time. And they've been so successful at our firm, so we really wanted to replicate that. And the success of the program stems in part from the fact that the firm culturally really acknowledges and supports the underpinning for the program itself. And it's a group of people who have a really fundamental belief that you don't you know, lose brain cells when you're out for a year or two years or whatever it may be. And so for me, it's also been rewarding and help to help you know, structure the program and think about how it works best. And we have also implemented alongside the program um, a real 
focus on integration so that when we're bringing people in who have been out of the workforce for however long, we are, you know, setting them up side by side with mentors, with people who are going to help them meet people and adjust to the burdens that are, you know, the billable hour requirement or whatever it may be. And again, it goes back to what I think I said at the very beginning, which is in this world we all live in, it's you have to be really, really purposeful about everything you do in order to make it work. You can't just expect things to happen. On that note, actually, Jen, so what can universities do and what can law firms and public employers in, around the U.S. do to ensure greater gender equi equities, specifically around motherhood and caregiving? Yeah. So one of the initiatives we've taken on here, actually, at the Burn Brown Women's Leadership Network is um, to be a partner with, um, with, with various sort of business and communications leaders who are auditing the private sector. It, it's more of, a, a, honestly, a post-Dobbs reproductive health uh, assessment, but figuring out and understanding what benefits are being offered, what benefits could be offered. Um, and it's, it's, been sort, it's been brought into a reproductive plus maternal health um, analysis. And so I've been thinking about that a lot, that what we feel we're doing in this sort of like emergency situation, how much broader it can be, because the, the this sort of span of caregiving isn't just about pregnancy it's, uh, and, and, and the reproduction sort of chapter, but it's, it's the full panoply of our lives, and caregiving covers so many different corners. So we've been trying to infuse that into that auditing process. So. Um, I, I would also encourage folks in their own workplaces to take that on, to really ask and understand what benefits are being offered and why. Um, sometimes they're HR specific, sometimes they're, they're more of an ethos or a philosophical question, and sometimes they're sort of a personality practice, I think, too. What is the policy versus how is it being implemented? Um, I think especially for nonprofit organizations, which, which often maybe have a little bit more flexibility um, in terms of aligning mission with, with that kind of um, practice, um, they should be very forthright about being I mean, public about it um, so that there are ways for others to observe, there are ways for others to learn. It's not just about attracting the best employees or having a, having a workplace that aligns with their values, but being a role model and a leader. Um, so if there are metrics to share, if there are best practices to share, uh, to be very cooperative and public about that. And again, that's not just gonna happen. These are the things that employees and job applicants um, and law students can be asking about and be talking about. Um, and then I've been thinking a lot in terms of the public policy um, vision, and it's really great to have a public policymaker here with us. You know, during the height of the pandemic, there was, it, we had a different Congress, um, but there was a, a real concerted look at what was happening to parents in America in particular when there was no school and work to go to and Zoom to manage. And, and we saw, you know, in Build Back Better and other pieces of legislation that were introduced a real concerted and, and deliberate concentration on parenting in America. And, and I fear that, one, we've lost you know, a house that's, that has the ability to, to advance that um, and a dysfunctional Congress writ large, but so, there's so much there, there's so much value in what was part of that um, machinery at the time, whether it was focusing on educational opportunities or universal pre-K, whether it was focusing on paid leave, um, you know, we're, we're one of very few wealthy nations that still does not offer paid leave, uh, parental or otherwise, and, um, and, and, and really being deliberate about resurrecting that agenda. It shouldn't take a pandemic to, to blow the lid on that, although it did, and it would be really a lost opportunity if that went by the wayside now. So those would be my sort of, if I have to, I like to alliterate, that's part of the writer in me, and I would say audit. Um, acknowledge and advocate. <laughs> That's good. I can't help it. I'm like, I become like Dr. Seuss when I'm in the and, and they just come to me, and then I do it with obnoxious and weird, but there it was. There it was. That's really good. Um, so now we're going to do one final question, but this is lightning round. Let's see, 
30 seconds or less. <laughs> so back, since we're back in the law school, we're going to make sure to have that uh, typekeeping. But it's the same question for everyone. So we've heard a lot about different workplaces here, and we've heard about the effects of the pandemic. And we've kind of, even though in our conversation, we've kind of alluded to, in, while we were waiting, was, you know, what about flexibility? What about this? And so I want to ask each of you, if you could offer your workplace or sector one recommendation to implement in support of caregivers and family-friendly workplaces, what would that recommendation be? Um, Council member Ong, you're up first. Oh, okay. This is, this is going to take a little bit more than 30 seconds. I'm going to make it quick. Um, so I actually, in my professional career, I had a job in um, a law firm, I had a job in the not-for-profit sector, and now it's government, more like elected official politics. And I would just, my advice to all of you is don't really have some preconceived notions about which one would be the most flexible and which one would give you um, the most ability to raise a family or take care of your parents. Um, I think, like, I remember sitting out here, like, all of you, I was like, oh, I'm going to go this field because I think this will give me the most of, you know, what I want. My biggest advice to you is you really have to be upfront with yourself about what you want and the amount of time you're willing to give it. And also really, I think, really be honest with your employer too about what that is too. I think there's always like adults saying, oh, if I don't share everything up front, maybe things will work out. I guarantee you it's not going to really work out. I think it's really important to be honest with yourself and it's really honest with your employer and ask your employer really what are their expectations. And don't think somehow along the way, maybe an employer would change what the expectation is. So one of the biggest ones is this remote working. If your employer is saying to you that there's probably no options remote working, I wouldn't hedge my bet thinking like eventually <laughs> there will be remote working. And that's what I'm going to leave all of you with. Andrea, do you want to go next? Yeah, I'm cheating a little bit because it's been <laughs> said in part. But for law firms, my biggest advice would be for them to acknowledge that every caregiver is going to be in a different situation and to just say we have a policy where you can come back full time or come back 80% or you know anything like that that's black and white whether it's black white red and orange or just black and white those kinds of choices are never going to create a successful environment for all of us to be who we want to be how we want to be it and it results in you know, firms having people who are not their best selves or people, frankly, just leaving because it doesn't work. So I think that law firms generally have a really long way to go in creating that kind of flexibility and acknowledgement that people can work in different ways and still be really successful and really good providers of client service. I'm going to build on that a little bit to say that we're in a moment now, if there was ever a moment to revisit these questions, that this is, this is it. Um, you know, I, I'm, I, we were all chatting before about our love or lack thereof of hybrid work or remote work. I'm an I'm a in-person kind of person. Um, I also recognize my kids are grown and my caregiving responsibilities are different, but now is the time to be having those conversations. Come to the table productively, come to the table expecting that there's going to be compromise. And then there's an internal piece of it too, which maybe is really cliche, um, that, which is that nobody can have it all every single day of their lives. Um, but you would love to think that over the course of your life or over the arc of your life, you figured out a way to put the pieces together. So as people starting your careers, for the students in the room, have that faith and have that patience. Um, it doesn't mean you're selling out. It doesn't mean you're, you're abandoning your ideals or your future path or your family. If you make different decisions different days of the week, we can all wake up the next day and start it again. But so it's little two pieces there. Yeah, I would say like flexibility is really key, but I feel like I actually had a decent amount of flexibility before the pandemic, just because I think as lawyers, if you're working on a bunch of different matters, like you can at times like block off a couple hours here or there to do things during the day. Um, uh, and, but for me, I think what Andrea was saying was like a really, is a really key thing. Part-time work is something that I would really like to see work. So actually one of the reasons why I chose my law, my, my law firm is that they do let you work part-time. So they have an 80% uh, for 80% 80, 80 work for 80% pay structure uh, that they grant as a matter of course, and they also let people work less schedules than that as well. 
Um, I'm fairly new, and so I've decided to kind of like see how things go. But when I look towards the future, and my husband and I talk about, like, do we want more kids? What do we want to do? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds crazy. Um, uh, I like, that was something that was really important to me because I feel like flexibility is something that you can set boundaries and like kind of figure out how to make flexibility. But I think like if you're shifting the hours from the day to the evening or the weekends or whatever when your kids are asleep you're still working that many hours. <laughs> so if you're like working that many hours and then caregiving a bunch of hours, you're not sleeping, you're not working out, you're not like looking at your health. So to me, that like, I think part-time is, is the future. Thank you all so much for your answers. Um, I know I have a lot to ruminate on. I have a lot of keywords on my notepad that I want to <laughs> think about. Um, we want to open the floor to see if there are any audience questions, but if not, I do have one final burning one I'd love to pose. But if you do have a question, feel free to raise your hand, and we have mics. Yeah, please. There are mics up at the front. Yeah, if you could. Yeah, yeah just go. Yeah. It should be on. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Tasneem. I'm an LLM student at NYU right now. I am an Indian lawyer. And uh, thank you so much for taking out the time to be here while, you know, obviously having so many competing interests in your time. Uh, my question is directed at Andrea because I am actually interested in corporate law. And this is the first time I'm at an event like this where I feel comfortable saying that, you know, I see myself being a caregiver in the future, and I want to be a corporate lawyer. And I feel like I've never been able to admit that to anyone in like a public space. Um, having said that, Andrea, you mentioned that uh, you were at a big law firm uh, before you joined Freshfields for a significant amount of time. And you said you moved to Freshfields because they were more welcoming to your uh, caregiving responsibilities and to parenting, right? I was just wondering if you'd be comfortable contrasting what you felt at your previous firm and what, you know, what was it that you felt conflicted with your uh, parenting responsibilities? Because you spent some time talking about fresh wheels, but I was just wondering what went wrong. Or like, you know, what was something that, and I don't want to pick names or anything on the firm, but you know, what was something that they could have done better? That's, that's something I was really curious about. And thank you so much, once more. Yeah, of course. And I will preface by saying that I had a great upbringing at my prior firm and they trained me to be the person I am. But there, there are ways everywhere can improve, right? And I think a couple of things um, I found to be um, real struggles for me. One, I didn't have female mentors. I really struggled to find, like I said before, people who I wanted to emulate. And I would sit in the audience and there would be panels of lawyers internally at the firm who were women who were talking about their own careers and how they had been successful. And in most cases, the answer was kind of this sort of throw money at the problem, the kids being the problem <laughs> approach, right? We've probably all heard it. It's just hire another night nurse, hire another nanny. I have five nannies. I have one in the Hamptons. I have one here. And like, I was like, that's just not the kind of person who I wanted to be as a parent. So I struggled to find people to emulate. When I came back after six years of being out in a law firm, there are, it's one of the problems of law firms, right? We are all managers of the firm. It is not, law firms are not institutions where you hire people to um, do all the managerial type positions that regular institutions do, like we do it ourselves. And so you have to put lawyers in admin type positions. So you have somebody doing staffing, you have somebody heading the mentorship committee, you have somebody heading the diversity committee, and it's all roles that we do as lawyers. And I found that I was constantly put into those positions and they kind of felt like mommy track positions. And I would get at a lot of them, and I had a council title, which was like a non-equity partner title. And whenever I wanted to discuss an equity partnership position, the answer was kind of like, well, you've spent all this time in these administrative type roles and not doing the little work. And so it's kind of like, but you put me in these mommy track type roles, and now you're telling me I can't get there. And so that was partly, honestly, where I learned that I really needed to 
find people and be proactive about people who are going to mentor and sponsor me and figure out what kind of institution I really wanted to be a part of. And so I did have people who always supported me. They were the people who I ended up following to Freshfields where I am now. But, you know, back to the, the shift, it, a lot of it really did have to do with seeing how many women were in leadership positions at this firm that was actually much bigger and much more global. And feeling when I interviewed there, like it was a place where women had a voice, mothers had a voice, and people had really, really different backgrounds and a real sort of fundamental respect for those different backgrounds. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for being here. And please join me in thanking our amazing.